Well, hello, everybody. Um, thank you for um, coming to the first of the master classes, uh, April 4th, 2014, uh, with Henry Rosemont. Um, and we are <coughs> very, very pleased that he's able to, to join us today and also tomorrow and Saturday. Um, and um, Joanne Rosemont is also here. Thank you very much for coming, too. Um, I thought it would be a, a good idea to introduce ourselves and to go around the table um, in just uh, one or two sentences, and then um, and then we can uh, begin. Excellent. Carlos, would you like to begin? Uh, my name is Carlos Mercado. I <coughs> teach philosophy here at Middlesex. Um, I'm Caitlin Jordan. Just graduated Smith College. Back here for some extra classes before grad school. Hi. I'm Karen Oster, Chair of Performing Arts here at Middlesex. And I'm Michael Rodman, Teach Psychology and Chairperson of Behavioral Sciences. And I always have to say, I, I, you know, I took a class with you in 1993, one of the early Middlesex people out at the East-West Center, and it, it has stayed with me all those years. Oh, so, I, you know, just like I say, oh, you, the, the, the impact for us who are not Philosophers are in the discipline. You, I want you to know it. Uh, it works. You know. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm Kathy McCarran, and I'm the chair of the English department. And I saw you in 2013, but I feel the same as Michael. So <laughs> in the last year. Yeah. I'm Shelley Hawks. I teach art history, and uh, I have a PhD in Chinese history from Brown. Brown. And I've, uh -huh. I've met you once before, and I really admire your work. Uh -huh. Nina Davidson, I teach English here in Bedford. Uh, Donna Katie. <laughs> Who? Yeah. Say no more. Hey, well, <laughs> Katina Plumbled, but um, humanities person to my core and social science person to my core, and 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 uh, certainly a disciple at your <laughs> a disciple <laughs> at your feet. Uh, Gail Mooney, I teach literature and English here, and I've been to the East West Center twice. So yeah. With Karen, um, I think this is the first. I, I occasionally have to say honestly that, um, well, I have a tough act to follow, but in this case, I guess I'm following myself. <laughs> 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 some years in the past, and I hope I haven't completely lost uh, what touch I had. It's very nice to, to to be with you. As I was telling a couple of you here, I don't lecture too much anymore. I'm not going to lecture over much. These couple of days I'm going to talk with you rather than to you or at you. Uh, but I do make uh, exceptions for friends, and Donna has been a, a very good friend, uh, both Joanne and myself, for some time, and we could not resist her <laughs> uh, uh, request to come here. I say, especially since I have good memories of being here before and visiting with you in different capacities, lectures, seminars, sessions, and things like that. You're very well thought of, actually. Middlesex, by the ASD people, people all over. It is of the, there are a number of learning centers, uh, but Peter and a number of us who have lectured, as well as Roger and Betty, always speak very highly of, uh, of Middlesex, um, significantly because of Donna's work, significantly because of you as faculty, Julian Farland as well. I hope he, he's retired now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's, Middlesex is held in high esteem in the ASDP. Pro, uh, people's um, program. Um, what I'd like to do is um, kind of give you ways of approaching the text. Some of the material I'll be talking about will just be reinforcing things that are in my little book, uh, The Reader's Companion, and which I don't think you should ever assign to a class because it's just too damn expensive. <laughs> uh, I, I'm trying to get them to put a cheap paperback out but the book can be a good one for you to use in your teaching, I think, if you do it right. But the, the most effective way for you to use it in your teaching is for you to use it yourself as well to, to come to terms with the book and turn it from something other than a textbook into being your friend. That'll be one of my themes for today. Um, and probably a little bit to tomorrow uh, as, as well. Uh, so if you're not a friend of the Analects yet, I suspect some of you are, but my job I'll take this weekend is to make you a friend of the <laughs> Analects and get you very much better acquainted with, uh, with each other. Um, 
I w will hope myself start with some lectures about ways to approach the text to give some background to make sure we're kind of on the same page and get you to think of some things that perhaps you have only unconsciously or subconsciously had in mind when you've approached this text or, or so, an, another one like it, a sacred text from any civilization. Um, unlike in the little book, though, I, I will give you some of my own views, I think, of the, the, the best way to read the Analects. Uh, not that, it, obviously, you're going to be examined on it on Rosemont's interpretation, but I'll talk about that, too. Um, let me talk a little bit about it as a book, just simply a book. It is a book, but just barely a book, i.e. it is, you know, there it is, you have a copy, I have a copy. But it wasn't written as a book. Um, indeed, we don't have the foggiest notion of who put it down. Or exactly when, or why? <laughs> As we don't, the details aren't there. Sometimes the chapters, the sections, fit together for a little while, but then they just go all over the place. <coughs> it looks like the original draft of the first book on fortune cookie fortunes, <laughs> in many respects. There doesn't seem to be much rhyme or reason to it. We don't know who the editors were. It's a kind of a mystery. At the same time, with the exception of the Bible, it's probably been the most influential book in the history of the human race, in the terms of the number of people who have lived and died in accordance with the vision of what it is to be human and what it is to be a good society um, over the course of 20 <coughs> years. I say only the Bible, I think, compares in that respect. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit as we, before we dig into the book at all, is, is the Bible, because it's looming very large in the back of your mind as you approach the Analect, unless you're very different from the other faculty and students I've worked with over the years. It's there, working on you. Uh, in the sense that you think, okay, this is a sacred text, or at least it's a classic text, a very important text. So it has to bear some, the Bible is going to be what you're going to put up for comparison. The field of comparative religion, the field of comparative philosophy, but especially comparative religion, started with missionaries who read these books to see whether or not they were compatible with, with Christian views. That was what the question they asked. How do we approach these, these texts? Some of them found God in between the pages, others didn't find God. By coincidence, it tended to be the missionaries who found God in this text, and non-Christians didn't do it anywhere near as efficiently. <laughs> Most of us don't find a God in there in the same way. But if it has to be religion, it has to be something like the Bible. Uh, and I want to suggest it isn't. In, in a very important way, because we, 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 people will approach this book as they do the Bible and almost all others. What is the answer they give to the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? It's a question everybody asks, bar none. Some point in time, you just start reflecting, what's the meaning of it all? Why am I here? What is the meaning of life? It's a curious question. Because we're not sure even what would count as an answer. You know, if you're asked, well, what's the recipe for making baking powder biscuits? You know, it's going to have to have you know, tablespoons of this or that, or cups of this or cups of that. Or you're going to expect a lot of legal jargon if you ask, what's the best way to write up a You may not know what the right answer is, but you know, what serves might serve as a, as a right kind of answer. What would serve as the right kind of answer to the question of the meaning of life? Or how should I face the prospect of my death? <coughs> should I talk to a minister? Should I make out a will? Should I blow all my money while I can? Or what, what even count as an answer to or from what area? And this has it, but we say, but there, there must be an answer. It's a question everybody asks. So it's important for me to start this afternoon by saying, no, it isn't. Mm -hmm. Only the inheritors of the Abrahamic tradition have asked that question. 
Chinese did not ask that question. I hate to try to get back in the head of someone who's been dead two and a half millennia, but I swear Confucius would not understand the question of what would my count as the meaning of life. Nor would the uh, Indians. It's not a... If you read the Bhagavad Gita, I assume a number of you have read the Gita, maybe a number of times, Krishna doesn't tell him the meaning of life, he doesn't tell Arjuna. What he tells Arjuna is, you must fight, and here's why. And how it can lead to your spiritual growth. But that's all. He doesn't talk about the meaning of life. The reason for that is India has about 3,000 creation myths. No two of which are compatible with any others, or for the most <coughs> part. China doesn't have any creation myths during the formative period of its philosophers. The first creation myths don't come into China until several centuries after Confucius is dead, and they start out as fairy tales for children. There are little gods in China, but they tend to be dead people. So the significance of that is, compared to the Hebraic, Christian, and Islamic traditions, is we have exactly one creation myth. Most people don't know much about Enkidu, things like that, and Gilgamesh. <coughs> but we have one creation myth. We know the world was created by someone who is all good. We know he created for a purpose. There's a reason why he created it, or a multiplicity of reasons. And therefore, lower down the level, there must have been a reason why he created us to be in this world. What is that? What's the meaning of life? What's the meaning of life? If, however, you know that all the creation stories are, in a sense, children's fairy tales from the Indian tradition, or this never even has been raised as a question, <coughs> as I mean, sometimes it's hard to get into the heads of people from another culture. We can never do it entirely, of course, even at our best. We can make some educated guesses based on how we read and interpret and cite from the texts that are still extant and that we can work with. And it just seems like for the Chinese, the, the world just always was, is, and always will be. Human beings were once upon a time more primitive than they were by the time of Confucius. So we had this one sage king who brought the Chinese agriculture. We had another sage king associated with the flood myth the great Yi who drained the fields and dammed up the swamps and things like that. And we had another sage king who brought medicine to the black-haired ones and it's like that, but that's all. That's all. And they're revered, but they are dead people. A lot of them lived a long time, but when they died, they all stayed dead. Except to kind of, but although we honor them. I'll probably get to that by Saturday, by tomorrow. So you don't have that question, what is the meaning of life? Why did God create this? I, I, I'm attaching significance to it because obviously what I, I've given a lot of my life to is trying to get people to look through the window of Chinese philosophy and have it become a mirror of their own culture. Look through the window to understand what these other people are like and therefore come understand yourself in ways that you haven't done before. It certainly did that for me. It was incredibly liberating. I started getting a handle on different dimensions of Chinese thought. And I said, wow, I didn't see how my own culture had influenced me in this or that particular way. But it surely has done so. So then the, the, the question that we see that when you ask the meaning of life against that kind of a background, it's a little much easier to also understand the history of Western science and why no other civilization has had a science like the West has. 
China had science and India had science, but they were based on very, very different operating principles. A lot of the things that the Chinese did, i.e. acupuncture, moxibustion, a lot of people just say, are well, they're nonsense, or if they work, we don't know why they work, but they can't work because they're built on a different model of what it is to be a human being in Western medicine. <coughs> But Western medicine, uh, Western science, well, in medicine a little as well, is kind of grounded in, well, it's, I don't know what the answer to the meaning of life is, why God created the world and me in it. But maybe if we get a little clearer on what in detail he created, we can get a deeper understanding, perhaps, of why he created it. And you're going to see that little intellectual push there toward investigating the world. <coughs> it wasn't until after Newton's time, Leibniz and Newton, that science kind of became separated entirely from being a spiritual discipline. Most early scientists were trying to understand God's handiwork. That goes for Copernicus, it goes for Galileo, it goes for all those supposed skeptics. They were trying to understand God's handiwork. And that's a significant reason, not the total reason, <coughs> why Western science looks as it does and Chinese science looks very differently. Maybe I can touch <coughs> on that a little bit later. So then, first theme is get the question of the meaning of life out of your head when you approach this text and urge your students to do the same thing. So why read it? Because it'll give you a much better shot at finding meaning in life. Mm. In life. The shift of the preposition is fairly significant. Fairly significant. This is a very optimistic book. You not only will not only be talking about ethics a bit here and politics, because for the Chinese, you can't really separate one from the other. We make an artificial distinction. We'll also be talking about spirituality in, in a good sense uh, of spiritual development. And we'll do it without asking you to believe anything that flies in the face of the laws of physics or biology or geology. That is, there's no theology here, there's no God. There's no, you don't even have to accept the notion of the chi. You should, it's there. <laughs> but it isn't, I mean, there are, and I have to say that carefully because, of course, I think there will soon be, and it's indeed it's even beginning, a renaissance of interest in classical Indian thought, say, with the Bhagavad Gita. There, there are efforts at renewing Hindu civilization and trying to come to terms with modernity and globalization and everything else like that. And of course, books like the Gita and the Upanishads and so on are integral parts of Hindu civilization. So people are trying to come to terms with those. But then they're stuck with things like Varna, caste, and some things about the gods getting people to stop thinking about Vishnu, Krishna, Shiva, and Brahma uh, is not easy. The Chinese are doing that too. That is, there's a really strong revival of Confucianism, uh, both as a religion and as, and as more or less a political and ethical system going on in China today, uh, from which the government is overall aloof, contrary to what you might read in the Washington Post and the New York <coughs> Times. Um, but and so they're doing, but they don't have to worry about the theology. They don't have that kind of problem, which means they have to excise. They are really struggling with the question, as everyone must, about how it was that the hierarchy of that is built into Confucianism, starting with the Analects, and we'll talk about that, got into the very oppressive patriarchy system and the sexism, because it's not entailed there. The idea of unquestioning obedience, for example, to your your parents, there is was made into kind of like a, a law. Confucius said, he did say you should obey your parents. 
But you also say if your parents are giving you bad information, bad, re bad advice, you've got to argue with them. It's clear in the text, and so we'll find a couple in here, and I can show you whole passages from the other book that Roger and I translated, the Filial Piety Classic, uh, many of those. But it, that's a question Chinese are dealing with. How do we get the Confucianism without it falling into the so-called patriarchy, sexism, homophobia, and things like that? You don't find it in the text themselves that much. So there is a renaissance in, in these going, going on, but see, the Confucians do have the edge of not having anything that they suggest that we do that requires believing a creed, or requires a theology, or requires believing that occasionally the laws of physics can be suspended on special occasions. Simply don't, don't have that. That makes the messages that it contains, paradoxically perhaps, to Christians and to Jews and to Muslims. Because there isn't any theology in the Analects, there can't be any theology that contradicts the Hebrew Scriptures or the Gospels or anything else in the New Testament or any of the Surahs in the, in the Quran. And because there isn't any theology in it, it can also teach atheists and agnostics a few things as well. And so that's what I say. If there are ways to make this book your friend, to help you with that question, which is a very different question than the meaning of life, is finding meaning in life. And that in itself, I would hope you would see as a huge plus from it not being a creed or having a theology <clears throat> because it means we each have to find our own answer to that question. There is no one size fits all. If I had it with respect to ethics, if I had to describe Confucius, I would say he is an unprincipled amoralist. <laughs> you will find no principles in the analects. Oh, sorry. In, um, in the analects. Some people claim to find one, the negative version of the golden rule. And there isn't any concept of morals in the analects either. Because we want to talk about morals, we want to talk about euthanasia, or we want to talk about abortion or any of the other really tough things. We have a particular vocabulary that we use. Uh, the idea of freedom. The person is free. The person is free to choose. We have dilemmas when it looks like no matter which way we go, we're going to do something bad. We have a difference between the split between the public and the private. We have liberty as well as freedom. We have autonomy. And we have the concept of choice. We have the word ought. You need all of those words in order to talk about a moral problem. None of those words are in classical Chinese. None of them. So whatever Confucius is doing, he's not doing ethics as we tend to think of it in the West today. You can't anymore bring Kant or Mill or John Rawls or any of those other people to bear on Confucius, in my estimation, then you should bring the, uh, the good book and thoughts about the Creator. That means I'm going to suggest you have to, and you have to work at it to read this text on its terms, not yours. You've got to leave behind as much intellectual baggage, I don't mean that pejoratively, whether it's Plato and Aristotle or Kant and Mill, if you're a philosopher, or whether it's <coughs> uh, St. Augustine or St. Thomas or anyone else, if you're in religious studies or whoever, try to read it on its terms rather than on ours. 
So, so much for the meaning of life, the meaning in, in life, in approaching the book. And what I'd like to have was start with, I, I don't want to go through this book Syrianum, but to emphasize the point that you have to learn to read it for yourself <coughs> and it's sense by yourself, even though I'm going to give you clues today and there are other clues in the book, you have to work at it yourself because in a strange way, and this is where Confucianism also differs from any of the other world's religions or philosophies, um, you have, you must make it your own. It's a spiritual discipline to read and memorize this book. It's a genuine spirit, just like making pilgrimages is a spiritual discipline in the Abrahamic tradition. And like chanting is a spiritual tradition, a spiritual exercise, a spiritual discipline. Yoga is a spiritual discipline. We have lots and lots of physical performance of rituals, all those. Reading and memorizing is a spiritual discipline for Confucians. And I'll go to 1126, 1122 is what I want to say to make that hit that point very hard for you to, as you approach it. And uh, Su Lu inquired, on learning something, should one act upon it? And the master said, well, your father and elder brothers are still alive. How could you, on learning something, act on it? Then Ranyo asked the same question, and the master said, on learning something, act upon it. Well, <coughs> Gu Shi Hua said, when Su Lu asked the question, you observe that his father and elder brothers are still alive. When Ranyo asked the same question, you told him to act on what he learns. I am confused, unsurprisingly. <laughs> Could you explain this to me? And the master replied, Ranyo is diffident, and so I urged him on. But Sulu has the energy of two, and so I sought to rein him in. Okay, so think of the text, not, not this passage alone, but everything in there. When Confucius is answering a question, he's gearing it to the person who asks it. Yeah. That means if you're going you're to be good Confucian educators in a humane educational system, you would never have more, be given more students than whose name you could come to know. <laughs> and you could learn some things about them, too. <laughs> so you'd have a sense of why they were asking the question. The, you must keep in mind, then, for that, that language is a, is a social practice. Conveying information about the way the world is, was, or came to be is only one function of language. It is not the main function of language in early Chinese thought. If there is an analog at all for the way Confucius thinks of language, and almost all Confucians, and not a few Taoists as well, it would be from philosophers like John Searle and uh, J.L. Austin in talking about performatives. And I want to touch on that uh, again, to help you 